Hello. I've been getting questions about how to uh, use and to calculate strain, uh, results from strain gauge rosettes, and that seems like a pretty good idea. So let's talk about that now. Now a lot of us already know what strain gauges are. They're basically a foil resistor uh, that uh, we can mount on a part and we can measure strain directly. The big idea behind them is that there's a little wire that's basically printed on the piece of plastic. We stick that onto the surface of a part, and when the surface strains, that is, it gets longer or gets shorter, the little wire on there gets longer or shorter, and its strain changes. Now, the uh, strain gauge is only good in one direction. There's a sensitive axis on the gauge. And I don't know about you, I live in three-dimensional space, so there's potentially three normal strains I want to know about. And even if I'm looking on the surface of a part, which is where strain gauges are good, there's going to be two normal strains and one shear strain between them. So let's talk about how to, uh, how to uh, calculate those from strain gauge measurements using rosettes. Now I need an example. Um, I'm a guitar maker when I'm not doing this. Now I didn't make this, I bought this. Um, but what happens is I spend a lot of time thinking about the uh, forces, the stresses and strains on guitar bodies. There are the strings go along the neck here, and these under a lot of tension. So it, they're uh, around 10 pounds in English units, so about 45 newtons per string. Okay, so it's very uh, common to have, uh, let's see, 100, 200 pounds, something in that order. So like 500, 600, 700 newtons going along this, this axis here. That's a lot of force for something this small and this light. Okay, and it's bad if it falls apart. So I need something that's strong enough to be able to withstand those forces, but flexible enough to still, to still uh, make noise. Okay, so. Here's a guitar. Let's, let's say I want to know what the strains are here. Okay? Now this, this uh, guitar has what you'd call a preferred axis. It's almost symmetrical about the string axis here. Not quite. There's a little, little cut out here. But apart from that, it's basically symmetric about that axis. So it makes sense that I'd want to do my, my analysis, my calculations, using that as one of my coordinate axes. And it will be either X or Y, I imagine. Let's say I want to uh, figure out what uh, some strains are down here. So I want to know uh, strain in this direction, its perpendicular direction, and I want to know the, she the planar shear strain between the two. So I want to know epsilon x, epsilon y, and gamma xy. Well, here's the problem. Strain gauges mostly only measure normal strain. There is such a thing as a shear gauge, but they're fairly unusual. Typically what you'll see is you'll get a group of three uh, uh, conventional gauges that measure normal strain only. And they'll measure normal strain in whatever direction you happen to stick them on. Turns out there's an easy way to start with three normal strain measurements, as long as they're in three different directions, and calculate epsilon x, epsilon y, and gamma xy. And I'm going to go over that here. You can see it on the board behind me. But let me, let me uh, uh, show you how this is going to work. Now, regular strain gauges are really small. They may be that big. Hard to show you on a video here, so I, I cut some out of post-it notes here. This is a uh, imaginary strain gauge. So let's say I put one gauge right there, and one gauge right there, and one gauge right there. So there's there's a, there's my imaginary strain rosette made out of big post-it note strain gauges. Now I made this at 0, 90, and 45 for a very good reason. 45? Yeah, that's pretty close. Let's move on. 0, 90, and 45 because I want the angles that between the gauges to be fairly large, and I'll tell you why here in a second. So let's say I uh, put the gauge on and then I put strings on the guitar and bring the strings up to tension. So there's a change in the strain here, okay, that these gauges can see. I'll get one, two, three normal strains. Okay, what I want is I want a, nor a normal strain in this direction, a normal strain in that direction, and a shear between them. Now, most of the gauges I've ever seen are either 0, 45, 90 like this, or they have 120 degrees between gauges. Let's see if I can rig that up real quick for you here. No high tech, huh? Yeah, that's pretty close. There's, there's a uh, rosette that has 120 degrees there, 120 degrees there, and 120 degrees there. Between the 0, 45, 90 and the uh, plus minus 120, that accounts for almost all the rosettes I've ever seen. There, I'm sure there are others. Now, let's talk about how to calculate this now. I've got, say, three gauges here, and I'm going to, for, for simplicity, I'm going to start with 0, 45, 90. And let's say I've measured some, uh, 
let's say I've measured some strains here. Epsilon A, I'm going to say is, make sure I don't have my cheat sheet here, is 100 micro strain. Now that micro means 10 to the minus 6. Strain gauges, or strains are very small on most engineering materials, unless you're dealing with some weird polymer or something. So that's pretty typical, um, or at least representative. Epsilon B is 50 micro, and epsilon C is minus 50 micro strain. Now, these are things I've measured, okay? These are measured strains. So what we're doing here is we're doing a calculation where half the numbers are measured and half of them are calculated. Here's the set of equations that describes the coordinate transform between our measured data over here and the stuff we really want to know. I want to know epsilon x, strain in the x direction, in this case along the neck, epsilon y, and gamma xy, which is the shear strain between x, the x and y directions. Okay? And these numbers in here are just trig functions, and those are based on the angles the strain gauges make with respect to whatever axis I want to know about. Well, I need to know an axis or a coordinate system here. To make this simple, let's say x and y, okay? That would be along the direction of the neck, and that would be perpendicular to the neck. So just to pull this thing out again, x is going to be that direction, y will assume to be that direction. Now, I made these numbers up, I'll tell you right now, but I guarantee you, if you give me a part of some, some structure, and you give me a little latitude to apply forces, pressure, something like that to it, I'm sure I could make those numbers uh, show up on the, on the screen of my data acquisition system. So it doesn't really matter where these numbers come from. Let's assume for now we've measured them, and these are reasonable numbers. These aren't crazy. Okay, and we'll assume we've measured them. So now we want to calculate epsilon x, epsilon y, and gamma xy. Well, if you look at this set of equations here, this, this is one unknown, that's another unknown, and that's another unknown. So epsilon x, epsilon y, gamma xy. Well, fundamental theorem of algebra. If I want to calculate three things, I need three equations. There's your three equations. So far, so good. Now, everything that I didn't circle, those are known. Even though they're written down here as trig functions, those are numbers. We can calculate those. Because I know that theta A is zero, theta B, that's a, it's not a minus sign there, is 45, and theta C is 90. Okay? Those are my numbers, and so these are going to be numbers. Cosine of zero is one. Sine of zero is zero. Sine times cosine, that's zero, all right? Which means, since the way this is written, I can write this out in matrix form very easily. I can either go ahead and just solve it uh, through some uh, substitution or something, or I can write this out in matrix form. Let's try this. Epsilon A, Epsilon B, Epsilon C, and I need to call that matrix something. I'll call it S, I guess, for sign. Um, and we'll epsilon X, Epsilon Y, and Gamma XY. Okay? There's what this is going to look like with the, the, the S matrix being made up of those numbers just defined by the sines and the cosines. Okay? So I'm going to erase this here, and I'm going to write this out for you. Now, I can do this a couple of different ways. Since I know that the cosine of 0 is uh, 1, the sine of 0 is 0, and the sine of 90 is 0, a lot of these terms are going to drop out. Right? So let's see, how do I want to do this? this? This set of equations reduces to this. And let's see, epsilon c equals epsilon y. Now, this makes sense. That is aligned with the x-axis, and that is aligned with the y-axis. That You better get that, or something's wrong. And this is the only one that's a little bit interesting. Now, this is one of the reasons people use 0, 45, 90 gauges, because the, the math is pretty simple. Now, before I go any further, let me talk about why we want the angles between those gauges to be big. Now, the way the equation was written out, epsilon a, epsilon b, and ep I'm sorry, sig theta a, theta b, and theta c, the angles, can be anything. As long as they're not the same, you'll be able to invert that matrix. You'll be able to solve this system of equations. Theoretically, you could put 0, 2, and 4 degrees if you wanted. The problem is, when you, if you were to try that, nobody ever does that, and there's a good reason.
problem is that the difference between the sine of two, 2 degrees and the sine of 4 degrees is a very small number. Now, if your measurement is perfect, there's no noise, there's no electronic noise, there's no error, maybe you could get away with it. Well, unfortunately in the world I live in, there's no such thing as a perfect measurement. There's always noise, there's always uncertainty. And so if you make the angles between those gauges as big as you can, and the biggest they could be is 120 degrees, there's, remember the zero uh, plus minus 120 gauge, um, if you make these angles big, it minimizes the effect of measurement error and electronic noise. It makes your resulting calculation more accurate, less dominated by noise. So that's why we pick things like this. Now, these gauges usually come pre-printed, but you don't have to use pre-printed gauges. You can just grab three single gauges and stick them on um, in whatever way is convenient or whatever way you can fit. And as long as you know what the angles are, you can go through this calculation. Um, so anyway, back to this. If you work this out, if you plug all the numbers in and solve, which in this form means doing this, uh, let's see, I'll take S minus 1 times epsilon A, epsilon B, epsilon C. Okay, I know what that is. I can calculate that because I knew what that was. That was based only on my geometry. This I measured. Okay, that's the numbers up that I gave you up there. And I can solve for this. That's how this is going to work out. So by inverting that matrix right there, I got all the things I know on one side of the equation, all the things I don't know on the other side of the equation. Perfect. That's what I'm looking for. And so when you do that, you get, uh, unsurprisingly, in fact, let me erase this over here. Now, if that be epsilon A better be epsilon X, and epsilon C better be epsilon Y, and of course they are. So epsilon X is the same as epsilon A, that's 100 microstring. Epsilon y is the same as, uh, let's see, that, which is minus 50 microstrain. Did I get that right? Uh, it is. And then gamma xy, just the way the math works out, also equals 50 microstrain. So, what we've done is we started out with a strain gauge rosette. Three strain gauges that measure only normal strain, but they do it in three different directions. We assume also that this, this uh, rosette is so small that there's no uh, change in the strain field over the rosette. There's always a little, hey, it's an approximation. Um, but we start out with three normal strains in whatever directions happen to be convenient, and we're able to transform them into strains in along our assumed coordinate system. So I start out with A, B, and C in whatever directions those happen to be, and as long as I know what those directions are with respect to my coordinate system, I come up with epsilon x, epsilon y, and the shear strain between them. Pretty cool, huh? 